Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alexis Alvarez. I am the Director of Statewide Training at Florida Legal Services. I'm so excited and pleased to welcome you here today to our training about Florida bar grievance processes and the governance of the unlicensed practice of law. Today, we have an amazing speaker who knows this subject very, very, very well uh, and has graciously given her time in order to teach us so that we can be less afraid and uh, less stigmatized by uh, the Florida bars process. So thank you all for being here today and thank you in advance already to our speaker for being here. So housekeeping announcements before I go into, into, into introductions, excuse me. This is being recorded. A copy of this recording will be sent to anybody who registered regardless of the live attendance. We know you sometimes have to hop off go back to work, do the things that you need to do uh, in our community. So please stay on as long as you can. If you do hop off, don't worry, you will get a copy of this recording. Second housekeeping announcement is quest questions and answers. Please feel free to drop your questions into the chat. I'm gonna do my best to present them uh, in live time as they come up, especially if they pertain to the subject matter. So uh, drop them in the chat, drop them in the Q&A, and I will uh, get them read out loud. And the final piece of housekeeping announcements is CLE credit. So as, as all of our, our webinars are, this was approved for CLE credit, and I will announce that code uh, towards the end. I'll also drop it into the chat, um, and you will receive that code along with a copy of the recording, which will come in the form of an email from Zoom within 24 hours. But as always, you can always reach out to me directly if you don't see that email in your inbox and you need that information. Once I'm done talking, I'll put my email into the chat uh, for those who might need it or might miss uh, that email in their inbox. So, uh, and, I, and not really housekeeping, but major shout out. This is being uh, co-sponsored by the public interest law section of the Florida Bar. I will put that information into the chat as well. And for those who have heard me say this before, I can't say it enough. Uh, the public interest law section of the Florida Bar is an amazing community of public interest lawyers who are really passionate about the work that they and all of us do. I really encourage you to join. Um, it's just great to have a network of like-minded people and a support system. So I'll put that information into the chat and I hope to see you uh, join. So with that being said, I'd like to go forward with introducing our speaker, um, Michael Bradley. Uh, Michael is the managing attorney of Three Rivers Legal Services in Gainesville, Florida. She is a career public interest attorney, having worked in both criminal and civil law. Michael has served the 8th Judicial Circuit Grievance Committee Chair from 2019 to 2022 and currently serves the 8th Judicial Circuit Unlicensed Practice of Law Committee Chair. She is passionate about maintaining the ethics of the legal profession and hopes to be a resource to others in navigating the tough calls in the profession. And so with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Michael. Michael, thank you so much for being here. I'm gonna put myself on mute, um, but I'm here if there's anything that you need throughout this presentation and here for the audience, if there's anything that you all need as well. Well, thank you so much. I believe that you've oversold me, but um, I'll do the best that I can. And I did want to thank the public interest, um, the public interest section of the Florida Bar. It's really nice to be able to at least have some general information about some of these topics and then have people that we can follow up with um, if we have further questions. So if your job is anything like mine, as we get started on this webinar, somebody is going to have an emergency, you're gonna have, um, you know, the office is gonna go crazy. Um, so I'm gonna start with some takeaways, just because I'd like to get a few things out front before we dive into the, uh, the nitty gritty. And I'm sorry that it is gonna be a little bit uh, nitty gritty. I once went to an LSE compliance training and they started with, um, you know, choose the emoji that most closely resembles how you feel about compliance. And everybody chose the meh or the sad face. And then at the end, they did it again and everybody still chose the meh or the sad face. So my goal is just for it to not be like that. My goal is that if you get more familiar with the process and you know in a 
in a, a big goal sense, if you get involved in the process, um, you're just gonna, you're gonna feel more comfort with it and you're gonna know best strategies, not so that you're lax in your practice, but you know what is best practice and you know where you need to really tighten up and where you can relax a little bit. So um, my first takeaway for you is that you begin with the end in mind. So what does a successful practice look like in the area that you're in? Um, what does successful case management look like? How do you um, communicate with your clients? Do you have a standard flow for your cases as to when you get retainers, as to um, when you level up with your retainers? How do you keep your notes? Do you have a good case management system that stores all of those notes so that, you know, heaven forbid, you're gone, somebody could pick up the case where you left off. What is, you know, what is what does perfect look like? What does really good look like? And that's what you want to be moving toward at all times. So have the end in mind. Um, I would say practicing law is a lot, a lot less like art when you start out and you kind of see you know, where where the where the art goes, what it becomes, how it comes out of you. And a lot more like Monopoly, you need to have a strategy. There are many ways to win, let's say, but you have to know the rules of the game and you have to follow them. Uh, so just, you know, not abstract art, more like Monopoly. That's, that's how you want to do this. Secondly, I want you to know where most people go wrong. And because of confidentiality, I can't tell you uh, exact stories, but I can tell you common pitfalls and what what we see over and over again coming into the grievance committee. And if it gets all the way to the grievance committee, as we talk about in a minute, um, they're, they're usually a big problem. The things we see most often, neglecting your client, ne neglecting their, um, your client's matters. And I want you to know that it is human nature. If you have a really difficult client or a client that calls incessantly, you're not gonna want to put that person on the top of your list to call every day. If you have you know, a particularly difficult motion to draft, it's not gonna make it to the top of your list, but um, I absolutely subscribe to the uh, eat the frog theory, put it on the top of your list, get it done, move on with your day um, because neglecting those things and you know that pattern of neglect is going to be um, a big problem <laughs> with the bar. So communication with your clients and not neglecting those things. That's that's what I see more than anything else. Um, the second thing would be just a misunderstanding or not being on the same page. And this is where um, retainers are are key to the practice. And a retainer is not always required, but it's the it's the document that's going to protect you, especially in a legal services practice. The minute a client has one phone conversation with us, speaks with us one time, they will say, well, my attorney, blah, 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 blah. Sometimes they file things with the court and say, my attorney or so-and-so said this. But if you have a retainer where you have spelled out, you know, I'm providing you only with a pro se pleading, I'm not going to be representing you in court with regard to this eviction, you have that protection for you should the bar um, have a question about what you know the scope of your services was do keep in mind though that you've got to communicate that clearly you can't just um, push a paper across the table have them sign and then say okay i'm protected because what the client believes is ultimately um what's what's going to be you know what's going to rule the day with the bar so get on the same page make sure that you're always on the same page make sure that if you level up services you sign a new retainer as far as what the services now are and make sure that you know every conversation, the client knows what you're doing you and they know what you're not doing more, more than anything else, um, just so that there's no question about where things land. Um, I would say to the extent that you can help it, I see choosing the wrong client or representing the wrong person as being a big source of bar complaints. If you talk to someone and you know that their expectations are completely unreasonable, if you talk with someone and you know that um, they're sort of playing a game of gotcha, everybody has dealt with this, this type of client and you know someone probably 
comes to mind right away. To the extent that your, your job allows, I wouldn't take on those clients for more than you have to. Because if you get that sense right in the beginning, you're probably not wrong. So choosing the wrong client can be a problem for you and for your license. Um, everybody knows money is always an issue. Anytime you are handling someone's money or mishandling someone's money, you're going to have a problem. And I think if we all reflect on what personally would drive us crazy or, you know, I know that when you're hiring contractors, when you're doing you know, a home renovation project, this is where things get a little sticky too, but um, you need to be really carefully accounting for what, what money is for and um, what money has been spent and how, but realize too that when the bar gets involved, they're not limited to what the person has filed as the complaint. They can start to get documents that relate to the complaint and then realize, uh oh, we have some problems over here. And then they're going to, you know, then they're going to subpoena more documents. They're going to dig deeper. Um, and if they find problems with your trust account or your money, even if it's not in the case that that your complaint was filed, then you're going to have problems. Um, so be very careful with your client's money and your money, and they should never be shared. Um, the fifth thing is doing something that, that you aren't capable of doing or that you don't know how to do without the benefit of co-counsel or a mentor. The bar is really pushing for mentorship right now. And I think that it's probably one of the best initiatives that has existed because if you strike out on your own, especially you, you really don't know how to practice law until you've kind of observed how it goes a little bit. Um, but you can always associate co-counsel if it's a new area of law and you want to learn. And I think that's a, a terrific idea. But um, even if you have the very best of intentions, there are bar regulations that say you can't do something that you aren't able to do because you're ultimately not gonna not gonna benefit that client and the bar is there to protect the public. So those are the general takeaways. Let's go to this is the discipline roadmap. And I know that you can't read this one because I'm a PowerPoint failure, but two. Um, it is on the bar's website, so I did want to show it to you. And you should probably print it out, just have it there so that you kind of have a familiarity of the flow. Um, but we are going to walk through it. I know it's completely illogical. Um, the first stop is going to be the entrance ramp. We've got the Attorney Consumer Assistance Program. They're going to receive the complaints from clients, opposing counsel judges, um, other people. Keep in mind, um, I actually was very surprised at how many complaints we do receive from judges. So everybody thinks, you know, clients are the ones complaining and it's they don't like the outcome. But sometimes judges see something and they say, hey, you got to take a look at this person. They're not handling this correctly. It happens so much more than you would think. Um, then after after the attorney consumer assistance program gets a complaint, first of all, they have to determine if everything in that allegation is true, do we have a violation of the rules regarding um, the Florida bar? If not, they're gonna dismiss it. That's, it, it's closed, nothing happens. If there would be a violation, if all the things in the complaint are true, then they open a file and the lawyer gets 15 days to respond. I will tell you that, um, Sometimes ACAP gets, sometimes the number for ACAP gets away from the jail and everybody calls and says, my, client, my lawyer hasn't come to see me. I've never seen my discovery. They'll send you a letter that says, hey, go see your client. We're not opening a file. There's no need to respond. Um, you know, I would respond anyway because I'm just uh, really convinced that a response is what the bar um, is always looking for, <laughs> your side of the issue. Um, but they may decide, hey, there's there's nothing here and close it. If they do decide that they could close it after they receive your response as well. But if they decide, hey, this is a problem um, and we need to get involved, then it's going to go from there to your local grievance committee. 
I'm going to give a big plug right now to serving on a grievance committee. It's, you know, every year we get the Florida Bar Committee Preference Form. I think it comes out in January, maybe December, and you have to turn it in by January. And it says, do you want to serve on a grievance committee? Do you want to be on a UPL committee? Um, you know, check yes. It's really not a huge time commitment, but sitting in that room for me um, was very beneficial because then I could see this doesn't go exactly like I imagined it would. Um, the grievance committees are one at least one third non-lawyers. Usually you're looking at um, people that are in a different profession, sometimes a regulated profession. We've mostly had bankers, lawyers, but it could just be, um, you know, a person who stays home with their children. It could be anybody, but because they want to know, uh, they want a different perspective. And very often on my grievance committee, the lawyers kind of align in the way that we see things. And um, sometimes also the non-lawyers will align in the way that they see things. But the bar wants the public to be represented and they, they want kind of just a, a different perspective, a, a lay person's understanding of what has happened here. So um, it's for the committee then to determine whether or not there's probable cause to the complaint. So they're going, the bar council could, once once it comes from ACAP, the bar council could say, hey, I don't think, so. they could do a little investigation and say, I don't think anything further is merited. They could close it before they give it to the grievance committee. Um, if they give it to the grievance committee, then the grievance committee is going to be looking at probable cause. If there's no probable cause, they're going to issue a letter. Of, they're either just going to say, that's it, close it. They're going to issue a letter of advice and say, hey, we didn't find probable cause, but we do think that, you know, best practice, you would have, um, you know, followed up to, with this client after the hearing to explain what happened and where the case stood, um, you know, something like that. Or they can say, hey, we don't think there's probable cause, but you could use a little work with trust handling procedure. So we're gonna we're gonna send you to a diversion program. We're gonna ask that you attend this class. Um, your board of governors member is the person who reviews the grievance committee decision and can review at any point in the process. So they might pop into the meeting, or they can wait for the um, for the grievance committee to make a finding, or or not. Um, and I will tell you, at least in the Eighth Circuit, um, I can think of at least one time that we all came to a consensus and said, this is what we, we don't think there's probable cause. And the Board of Governors member said, I'm sorry, I disagree with that finding. And so they have, um, they have the option to kick it back or do something different with it. Um, I forgot, I did want to plug your circuit professionalism panel, and I think most circuits have these. I'm, I'm not 100% positive which ones do not. But if you think that there's I, some people see, okay, great, I can file a complaint against the opposing counsel, you can. And if there's something, you know, unethical, you you should. But if there's something that is just problematic or or maybe not best practices, you can always go the route of your circuit professionalism panel. And that's not a disciplinary panel, but it essentially is, they're gonna review the matter and there's gonna be some, some coaching. And they're gonna say, hey, on you know this aspect, we need you to do this. And it's, a, it's kind of a mediation between lawyers, not as to the case, but as to the practice of law and as to the, the communication between lawyers. All right, so the grievance committee, if they find probable cause, then um, charges are filed with the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, Court is going to appoint a county or circuit judge, and they're going to be the referee. So essentially, the judge presiding over um, that lawyer's case. And they're going to hear witnesses, receive evidence, recommend whether or not they they think the, the lawyer is guilty or innocent. I, I Those words seem stranger. But in the appropriate sanction. So the referee can also look at a consent judgment. If bar counsel says, hey, we're gonna have a trial, um, but if you would agree to go to this diversion program or if you would agree to a 30 day suspension, we'll present that to the referee and the referee can say yes or no. So um, that's what I mean by a consent judgment here. The referee's report um, is the board of governors. So the board of governors and the lawyer have 60 days to appeal. So if the board of governors feels like 
hey, the referee has gotten this wrong, um, then they can also challenge that here. So I can't stress to you the importance enough of your Board of Governors member. Um, Board of Governors elections, you need to pay attention. Who is that person? Is that a person that you want in charge of essentially the ethics of your circuit? And um, get to know your Board of Governors member because they're the person who essentially is going to make decisions about who is on these grievance committees and who is on the UPL committee. And to the extent that um, you're on their radar, they'll choose you. And they want to have a representative sample. They don't want everybody to be a civil law practitioner. They don't want everybody to be um, you know, in the private sector. They want some public interest lawyers. So you know, even if you just want to shoot an email and say, hey, you know, I, I'm really interested in this. How could I, um, you know, could I meet with you and talk about the process? I think that they would welcome that. And I'm sorry, if questions come in, Alexis, and, and you think we need to stop, you can just let me know that because I can't see the chat. So I will. Nothing has come in so All far. Right. Thank you. Um, so, the Supreme Court is going to review the report of the referee or the consent judgment. They can approve or disapprove. And then the enforcement with regard to what they have decided is going to come through their contempt powers. So no matter how much money you spent, no matter how hard you study for the bar, this is a license. It is a privilege to practice law, and that can be revoked for cause. So just don't, uh, it's not your right to be a lawyer, it's your it's your license, it's your privilege, just like to be a doctor. If you cut somebody's arm off unnecessarily, you're probably gonna take the license. All right, so let's talk about what the grievance committee could do. Um, this is rule 3-2, um, I've got F and J, F, J and L here, but I just wanted to point out that there's diversion to to these practice and professionalism enhancement programs, but there's also um, referral to, as in this is your sanction, you are going to take this, um, this course so that we know that you have learned what you need to learn to keep this from happening again. Um, these courses generally are live, they're in Tallahassee, the lawyer has to go there, stay there for multiple nights. Um, this is gonna be at your expense, not the bars. But um, if the bar is recommending diversion, just, just go ahead and do that. Um, but if they're sanctioning you to diversion, then um, you won't have any choice. But it is a good way for the bar to say, hey, we understand that what happened here, it wasn't good, but maybe there wasn't a lot of malintent. Um, let's, let's learn to do better. They do it very often with younger lawyers. So that's where I see it the most. Okay, so these are the types of discipline um, that you could receive out of the grievance committee process. An admonishment, I'm going to show one at the end. People think of this as, oh, you know, it's, you got off with a, a little warning. These are truly humiliating. I don't know if you've ever watched one. Um, they are, they're online, you can watch them, but there are also there are YouTube videos of these, and I'll show you one at the end. Um, they're really like the most shaming experience you could have as a lawyer. Um, here are, so minor misconduct. Here's a list of things that cannot be considered minor misconduct um, unless there are unusual circumstances. So I want you to note that because even if the committee says, okay, we wanna make a finding of minor misconduct, they can't make that finding generally unless there's some very unusual circumstances if any of these things are true, if you've misappropriated funds, if there's some actual prejudice to the clients or the you know, property rights or to their money, if you've had public discipline within the past three years, or if your misconduct is in the same, is the same type of misconduct that you've been disciplined for within the last five years, if it involves dishonesty, misrepresentation, deceit, or fraud, or it's a felony under applicable law. So dishonesty, um, that's going to be determined by the, you know, the, mem the investigating member of the grievance committee. 
if they think that that what happened was dishonest or was a misrepresentation. So um, there's a little bit of subjectivity within that word. You could be um, put on probation from the practice of law. You could have the public reprimand. Usually, I think those come out in the uh, they come out in the bar journal that gets sent out. Um, you could be suspended. Um, you could be disbarred. You could have a disciplinary revocation. Um, it's essentially being disbarred, which is some procedural differences. Your clients could be put on notice that this has happened. You could be made to forfeit your fees or pay restitution to the client. Um, there is also the possibility we do see with, um, especially with some older lawyers, that they will agree to voluntarily surrender their law license, shut their practice down, um, and that they will not return to the practice of law. Um, I've seen that where essentially there's been a health issue. The lawyer isn't functioning at 100% anymore. Um, and the bar gets a complaint. And then what really needs to happen is, is that person is um, needing to move on to something different. Forfeiture of fees I wanted to talk about. Um, you know, put your fee agreements in writing. I see so many times a person will say, well, you know, I just agreed to take $700 and, you know, up front. Well, you know, put that in writing and say, I'm taking $700 as a retainer, but if we get to this stage, I'm going to have to, you know, do X, Y, and Z, and then I'm going to require more. Or if you have an hourly fee, break it down and send the client monthly statements. Um, there's nothing that requires you to, you know, constantly update the client as to, you know, how you're spending that money, but the more you update them, the better. Um, people are really astonished at how fast lawyers move through move through money because we do have to do a lot of research. And we, you know, I mean, our hourly rate is, is not going to be cheap typically. So um, just the more communication as you go, the client's not surprised when you come back and say, well, I'm going to need another $5,000 because your 10,000 is, is gone. Um, just communicate that along the way. These are the things that the Florida Bar on, on their website says, these are, the, these are the big things that we want everybody to know. Um, that the Florida Bar is regulating the practice of law in Florida and nowhere else. So if you send, we often get complaints for lawyers in other states. That's, that's interesting, <laughs> but those states regulate their own attorneys. And then last that person is doing something in the state of Florida that is tantamount to the unlicensed practice of law, and they're not going to be interested in it. It could take it to the UPL um, section. They're regulating lawyers and not law firms. And the reason I point this out is because some people will feel like, well, I'm you know the low low person on the tape on the totem pole, and you know if my supervisor says I have to do it, then I have to do it. But this is your license, and so you have to protect your license. If there's something that you're being told to do and it's not within the rules of ethics, um, you need to do something about it because they're, they're regulating you and not your firm as a whole. Uh, and I know that that's a difficult situation to navigate, but um, keep in mind, you always will have this license if you handle it correctly, you may not always have that job. And sometimes that means you're gonna have to leave that job. Um, the Florida Bar is not, does not regulate judges or elected officials. Um, sure that you all know the JQC is who is going to regulate your judges and you can file a complaint online um, and they go through a whole different process. The Florida Bar regulatory process is an open system. So once that um, once there's a closure with the grievance committee, it's public record um, if they find probable cause. So there that any documents that we handle, they're all going to be able to be found um, if probable cause was found, and you can you can access those. Um, and you know, if you've ever looked on somebody when you do the lawyer search, Florida, you can usually see if that person has been um, disciplined. You can click right there and find out why, um, when, and all the all the nuances you may want. Um, the bar takes a proactive approach to preventing bad behavior. 
this is where the ethics hotline is very important. And I know that people have mixed feelings about it because they're just going to quote rules to you and they may not say do it or don't do it. But I will say I found it to be incredibly beneficial um, and that sometimes they will actually point you to an answer. You might have to make the final call of like, is it a yes or is it a no? But if they give me the rule number and you look at the rule and that rule clearly says you can or can't do what you are contemplating, um, you're going to have guidance there. And, you know, I've, I've called several times and I put notes in my system, talked to the ethics hotline, they advise, you know, the applicable rule is X, Y, Z. But you can also request a written opinion um, if you are considering something and you want to know how it's going to uh, play out with the bar, you can request a written opinion about that. Um, there's also the Legal Fuel Resource Center. There, are, I mean, you should just take a little time, go in and navigate it. <laughs> it's more than just job posting, but they do have a lot of resources for active Florida lawyers. Um, and the bar, you know, it is working to resolve complaints um, before they're filed. And that's where those uh, phone calls to ACAP come in that, um, hey, my attorney hasn't called me. And then they'll send you a letter, call your attorney. Only 25% of the cases um, have a file open from ACAP. Um, complaints don't always lead to uh, cases or discipline. We talked about all the different ways that a lawyer could be disciplined um, in, from least to most severe. And discipline is just one of the ways that they're regulating um, and trying to protect the public. There may be, you know, a, an attorney may be ordered into mental health treatment. They may be or, ordered to um, receive treatment for chemical dependency. Um, those are other ways that, that the bar could deal with the issue at hand. And I don't think of that as discipline, but system. At the Florida Bar, so these the staff attorneys and the bar council attorneys have worked in state agencies, they've worked in legal aid, they've worked in uh, military service, they, they kind of go all across the board. They want to have a variety of experience so that um, their perspectives are different. And then it depends on um, who your staff attorney is. I know that during my time on the grievance committee, I think we have three different staff attorneys. And that's a little unusual, but um, they are going to rotate so that you don't have, um, I think the goal would be that people don't get so comfortable with the circuit that they're in that they would feel nervous about administering some discipline or taking a case to trial with the referee. Um, this is your numerical breakdown. So from 2021 to 2022, we've got 3,380 files opened. 388 went to discipline with the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court issued orders in 236 with, with discipline imposed. Um, so if you look at that, that's a that's a huge number that were resolved in another way. I find this slide very comforting. You know, when you take the bar exam, they say like 80% pass, and that's a comforting number. I find this a little comforting too. All right. Um, before we move on to the unlicensed practice of law, does anybody have a question they want to ask about the grievance committee? And if it's not something I can answer, I'm, I'm not going to guess. And feel free to drop those questions into the chat or the Q and A. Nothing came up so far. I did put in uh, the Legal Fuel website and the Florida hotline info. Um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in. Perfect. And you know, keep those numbers handy, and I think it'll encourage you to use them when you need them. Um, just to have them right there. I know uh, as a public defender, I, I feel like I had to call the ethics hotline far more often than in civil practice, but, um, you know, some strange things have, have come up in civil practice, and it doesn't even have to be so far outside of the box. If there's something that you feel a little uneasy about, and you just aren't finding the rule, um, they're very nice, they're very knowledgeable. You know, I guess it depends who you get. The people I've dealt with have been very nice and very knowledgeable, so I just, I think it's worth a call. You don't have much to lose there. 
Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about when we see the unlicensed practice of law the most. Um, we get far fewer cases through the UPL committee than we do through the grievance committee. So I don't think it's, um, I don't think there's a, a ton of it happening out there. But also, I think people don't really know what is and what isn't, and they, you know, we don't, we don't really know when to take action, and there's not necessarily a clear person to take action. We see out-of-state lawyers practicing in Florida. That's probably number one um, that has come in um, without an author, something that authorizes them to do so. I should say, um, paralegals that are unsupervised or signing off on things that when they shouldn't. Um, without a supervising attorney looking over the work that was done and agreeing yes, it's correct and no, it's not correct, um, or just kind of going rogue. You don't want someone answering the phone in your office to say, oh, I've seen this, um, I've seen this before, I know what you're supposed to do, and you just send some legal advice, advice but that does happen as well. Um, we do get people from um, other countries where Essentially, I think it's it's almost like a, a translation issue in that in their country, they may be considered what we would call a lawyer, but it's not it's not the same field. Um, and I do think that that's more a, like a cultural misunderstanding, and usually those can be um, resolved through some education. Um, sovereign citizens, I don't know uh, how many of you have ever dealt with sovereign citizens. But because they don't feel that they're subject to, uh, they feel they're subject to maritime law only. Sometimes it gets interesting with sovereign citizens. They draft a lot of pleadings for um, other people that then get filed in court. But the point of the bar's regulation of the unlicensed practice of law is just to protect the public. They don't, they don't want people practicing law without the necessary skills and education to do so. Okay. Um, sorry, the last I was talking about is covered in chapter 10 of the rules regulating the Florida bar. Um, and the Board of Governors administers the UPL program and has the final responsibility. So are also there are branch attorneys that handle their trials and appeals, but Again, that Board of Governors member is very important. UPL committees, um, I would really encourage you to try. These are even less time commitment, assuming nothing interesting happens in your uh, in your area. Um, I think my first year, uh, I think maybe we had one case, but then my second year, we had a very large case. So. Um, Typically, it's a low time commitment, so I would I would consider it. You've got um, at least three members, one third of whom are non-lawyers on my committee. It is three members, one is a non-lawyer. The complaints have to be in writing and sworn to. If the bar receives a complaint and it's not sworn to, then they're going to send somebody out and have uh, have the complainant swear to it. So an investigating member gets assigned. They're non-adversarial and investigatory in nature, but that just means we're not talking about the rules of evidence anymore. We can subpoena information. Um, I love this fact that um, you can have undercover investigations when you're investigating UPL. Um, I just think that's a fun fact because they want they don't want people to know that they're looking at it um, if there's some salacious thing. I've never been involved in the undercover investigation in UPL, but I think it sounds fun. All right, so the UPL committee can decide that they want to close the case, that they want to send a cease and desist affidavit. That um, that that happens, I would say, more often than not. That's the resolution. Um, there might be a cease and desist affidavit with a monetary penalty if they if people are are paying for these services and, and those services aren't authorized by the Florida Bar, then very likely they're going to make them give them money back. You could have Supreme Court litigation. You could have indirect criminal contempt if the Supreme Court's already said, hey, you can't do um, what you're now doing. But they can also be prosecuted by the state attorney. So this is serious and it's a criminal offense if the state attorney picks it up and wants to 
um, processes. So what is UPL? The unlicensed practice of law is this two-part analysis of, is this the practice of law? And is it a practice that's authorized? So there are over 230 cases that deal with the unlicensed practice of law. I am not going to go through 230 cases, but I will say that those are very specific breakdowns of, we're going to go through 21 um, areas where you have the unlicensed practice of law or don't have the unlicensed practice of law. These cases are interpreting each one of those areas. So if you have a specific area of interest, if you want to know about, you know, when are accountants practicing law, what's the line there, then, you know, you need to focus on on that specific area because 230 is a lot to kind of take on in half an hour. <laughs> um, so I like to look at it, at, you know, the same as I would at a, a case closing for us. Is there law applied to specifically to the facts of, you know, fact scenario of that person? that's kind of the, the practicing of law. So we're not just giving general legal information, but we're taking the law and saying, in your situation, um, X, Y, or Z. So that's that's kind of my easy paraphrase of this, but that's the analysis. So the case that actually gives the definition of, is it the practice of law, is the Florida Bar versus Sperry. Um, I'm gonna let you read that. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but essentially is, is that person giving advice that you would you would require or you would want somebody with specific legal skills and knowledge to be um, giving that advice. So that's that's sort of the, the general breakdown of that, but having this case on hand is probably a good idea. Um, why does it matter? Like we talked about earlier, the, the court's big concern here is that they don't want people who are incompetent, people who are unethical or irresponsible practicing law. And none of us do either. We worked very hard for our law degrees. We went through you know, every, every type of character and fitness analysis to say, hey, this is a person that we trust to uh, you know, administer this advice. We know that they have the skills that they need. We know that they have the ethics that they need. And so as a member of the bar, it's as important to us as it is to the court and to the bar um, that we, we kind of watch over this. All right, so is it authorized? So these are some of the areas in which the, the practice of law may be authorized or um, there may be a way for you to practice within these areas. We'll go through them, that'll make sense. Um, so CPAs can deal with the IRS and tax matters. And um, essentially, those are kind of negotiating those tax matters. So we're not talking about um, tax court here. We're talking about um, approaching, the, approaching the IRS with a question with regard to your audit. Administrative practice, you will see this in legal services quite a bit because these are your um, housing authority hearings, these are your social security hearings. Um, so it's not a question of complexity because those two areas specifically are very complex, um, but the legislator um, can, has authorized that, that people can be represented by someone who is a non-attorney in those specific instances. So we aren't talking about difficulty there, we're just talking about express authorization. Um, appearing pro se, you cannot appear pro se if you're a corporation because you're not a person in, in that sense. Um, or if it's probate, that's not summary administration. The, um, the rules require that an attorney appear for probate that's not summary administration. But you know, you can represent yourself if you own a home and you've rented it out and you know. Your tenant has a meth lab, and you want to, you know, you want to evict them for safety. Then you file with the court. Federal practice: if there's a rule or regulation within that federal practice that allows it, you can do it. Um, but be prepared to to show what that is. 
if you are in-house counsel, um, pursuant to chapter 17, you can be in-house counsel and not be a Florida lawyer, but you can't go to court, not in Florida. All right, um, out-of-state attorneys could appear pro hoc vice, but not if they are living in Florida, that's their residence, uh, and not if they're a Florida bar applicant. So you can't kind of get a jump start, like move to Florida, appear pro hoc vice, but you've already moved to Florida, that's not gonna work. Um, and we have had some cases like that. Bankruptcy, you can't prepare the forms for another person. Kind of the same with the do-it-yourself legal kits and books. Um, the customer has to put the information in. So you could set up um, the, the forms, you could set up the kit, but you can't fill it in for someone else. Um, in evictions, a non-lawyer can't represent a third party. They can represent themselves, as long as they're not a corporation, but they can't represent a third party. This is where we see uh, the sovereign citizen stuff come in sometimes. Federal patent practice. If you're doing federal pat patent practice in the state of Florida, you need to stay in your lane. Don't do mostly federal patent practice and then a little bit of state court, you know, advice on the side, that's gonna get you in trouble. So that's um, very important that your practice is very deep. You know, defined if you have a website, you know, put on there the little star on your not authorized to practice in the state of Florida. You want to be very clear with your clients um, what you do and what you do not do. Um, federal tax practice. It is the practice of law, but it's authorized. Um, genealogists and air hunters, they can't solicit the heirs to try to recover money and they can't file pleadings on behalf of those heirs, but they can dig um, and they can get information. This is another area we see a lot of people get in trouble. If you're holding yourself out to perform legal services and that can be expressly or impliedly. So that, that's the part that, you know, that is a little bit subjective. The bar is going to look at whether or not somebody looks at your website and they get from what you have um, that you practice in the state of Florida. Um, I know that there was a, a case with some billboards. There were some issues with that. You don't want to be um, implying that you are a Florida attorney if you're not. And that's where that little disclaimer would be very important. Uh, immigration, you can go in front of the Department of Homeland Security, but that doesn't um, mean you can go to federal district court. Um, individual representation, can't represent somebody else. Insurance adjusters, this is talking about like settlement negotiations. This isn't um, going to court on behalf of the insurance company. They do have counsel for that. Um, they have to have counsel for that. Um, I didn't, I didn't write these. These are our bar words, but jailhouse lawyers, meaning that you can't give legal advice, draft pleadings, represent in court. And, you know, that does come up sometimes and it becomes really obvious by the style in which something is written and um, whether or not it was um, provided by another person. Law clerks, they have to be um, a CLI and they have to be supervised by an attorney if they're going to court. Mechanics liens, a non-lawyer can draft the notice but they can't draft the lien. Um, I've not seen one of those come through, but I could see where it could happen. Um, if you are preparing legal documents, that individual has to provide the information that's going in the legal document. Um, seminars of legal rights, those are only, um, these are your, these are the laws that pertain to this, not these are the law as applied to your facts. So that's really where the differentiation is. We see that more with um, realtors. If they want to present information, maybe regarding their housing law, things like that, it can't be as applied to facts. So no advice can be given. Um, this has been kind of a, a trending issue lately remote work. So can we have a New Jersey attorney who's sitting in Florida, but only practicing in New Jersey? Are they um, 
you know, are are they practicing law in Florida? It looks like I left off that little thing. I'm sorry. Um, but there is a Supreme Court opinion, and it essentially, as long as they're not trying to establish a law office in Florida, um, hold themselves out as having, you know, a Florida practice, providing advice on on Florida law matters, and they're just physically living here but practicing elsewhere. Um, the Supreme Court has said that's okay. And um, I have one quick video for you. Let's see if I can. Let's see if I can do this. And if you can't, I can tee it up. No, we will try. Not the most. Ooh. No, I can't even do it. Alexis, can you? It would probably be easier. You can do it. Here, put yourself on mute. <laughs> Absolutely. Us and for the entire Florida Bar, at the most fundamental level, you have repeatedly shown behavior so serious on so many occasions that this court felt it necessary to command you to appear today for a public reprimand. This is a very serious matter, Mr. Norkin. It's very unusual for any lawyer to be reprimanded in person before the Supreme Court. That fact alone underscores the gravity of your situation. The effectiveness of our legal system ultimately rests on the trust and confidence that the people confer upon the attorneys who practice in our courts. And that trust and confidence is seriously undermined by the grossly unprofessional actions you have exhibited. That is why we have ordered you to appear today for a public reprimand that's being broadcast throughout the state. It is one way we can assure the public that we take the lack of professionalism by a lawyer very seriously and that we will not hesitate to punish errant attorneys in a most public way. Mr. Norkin, this court, in its opinion, has found that you have continued to engage in rude and antagonistic behavior in judicial proceedings despite repeated warnings from judges. You have disrupted proceedings to such an extent that it was impossible for the presiding judges to conduct hearings. And the transcripts are very clear on these points. Despite the record evidence against you, Mr. Norkin, you have denied the patent lack of respect you have shown to others involving in these matters. Further, you have falsely accused a senior judge of having a conspiratorial relationship with opposing counsel, an allegation that, if true, could have subjected that judge to ethical or criminal investigation. And the referee hearing your case concluded that these allegations not only were false, but that you knew them to be false and you used them in an effort to obtain an advantage. You can never stop it, Alex. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that we can all see that um, this doesn't show any deference to the court um, and probably how he ended up there in the first place. Um, controlling, your, controlling your face is a big deal. I have seen a lot of these come through lately. Um, with regard to what I would deem obnoxious behavior in court and depositions and mediations. Um, and I know we all feel very strongly about our cases, but the less you can show on your face that you feel strongly about your case, the better is uh, my, from, from, you know, 11 years in, that's, that's kind of my takeaway. I know as a, probably as a young public defender, I made a lot more faces um, than I do now. And so I've learned. Um, and I I hope, you know, to go to court these days with a very neutral presence and just litigate the issues. And I think that, that um, that's pretty key. So um, I'd love to attempt to answer any questions that you have now. We have just a couple minutes. Perfect. A few questions came in. It might be good for you to mute while I ask them and then come off mute. Perfect. And while we're doing that, I'm just going to put the CLE code into the chat. So the first question um, <clears throat> that came up, it came in through the chat. It says, 
for an attorney with an office in another region of the state. Does a local grievance get filed or grievance back to the region of the office? Typically it's wherever the conduct took place, they'll, it will go back to that office. But sometimes um, they get moved around. And I know that my grievance committee dealt with um, a lot of Florida lawyers practicing immigration law in New Jersey this year because um, there was an immigration law case that came out that essentially encouraged, if you're gonna appeal um, somewhere along the way, you probably uh, grieved your attorney. So there's kind of an onslaught of those and they just took those and dispersed them throughout the state. So just because you know the conduct took place in the Eighth Circuit doesn't mean they're gonna give it to the Eighth Circuit, but most likely it will be in the Eighth Circuit unless um, we have too many cases and they can kick it to another one or if they feel like we can't have a fair resolution. Awesome. And then the other question that came in came through the Q&A um, and it was, is the investigating member of, I'm sorry, is the investigating member a member of the committee or employed by the Florida Bar? It is a Florida Bar attorney on the committee. So Bar Council is, is separate and apart. So you will have a Bar Council and then you will have your committee and from, um, and your committee will have a chair and a vice chair. But from that committee, it could be the chair or the vice chair, um, an investigating member is assigned. Sometimes based on familiarity with the area of practice, I got all the immigration ones because they speak Spanish. Wasn't necessarily what I wanted to do, but usually there's some tie to that person or that person just has the time and is willing to volunteer for that case, but not the bar council. But we do work very closely with the bar council in setting up um, maybe depositions or um, you know, trying to subpoena records. And you know, the one thing I meant to say that I, I think I left out is if there's a grievance and it's gone to committee and they're saying um, you're gonna have a deposition at that point, like please, please, please hire someone who deals in, in this type of law to represent you. Some, some types of grievances really aren't that serious, but if, you're, if you've gotten to the level of a subpoena and depositions and you know, the exchanging of these kinds of documents, I think you should at that point really consider um, hiring someone to represent you. Sorry, go ahead. So a few more questions coming into the chat. And I do see there is a comment that the CLE code is not being recognized. Um, if it's not being recognized, don't worry about it. I will contact the Florida Bar um, and I will email all of you um, as soon as I get that corrected. Um, it's kind of out of my hands. It's something that it, maybe they gave me the wrong number or something like that. So um, if I don't get it to you, uh, this afternoon, it'll it'll come to you via an email, and you can also email me directly. My email address is above alexis.alvarez at floridalegal.org. That way, if you want to stay on top of it, um, you can reach out to me. So we do have a few more questions that have been coming in, Michael, as, as we've been talking. And the first one that I have up here is, what are an attorney's responsibility with regard to supervising paralegals and support staff? So with regard to anyone who would be issuing any legal advice coming out of your office or preparing some documents, um, the attorney has the obligation to ensure that that advice is correct um, and, and compliance with the, the law and that the pleadings are correct, especially if a pleading is getting filed in your name, you have to have reviewed that. I've had attorneys say to me before, well, oh, sorry, my paralegal drafted it. Well, it would be filed in your name, so that's, uh, that's on you, but it has to be accurate. Um, so you need to be reviewing that advice every single time and correcting it if, if something has been, if they misspoke or misinterpreted something. Okay. And uh, another uh, question that came in through the chat is, may an attorney barred in Florida practice in Florida if they are not living in Florida full-time, i.e. remote law practice? An attorney barred in Florida can't practice in Florida period. Am I understanding the question? May an attorney barred in Florida uh, practice in Florida if they are not living in Florida full time? Oh, may they live in Florida and practice in another state? That would be up to the other state. If they're not, no, if they're Florida attorneys barred in Florida, mm -hmm. but they're not living in Florida full time, can they still practice in Florida? 
Okay, so I'm a Florida lawyer, barred in Florida, but I live in New Jersey and I'm practicing in Florida. Exactly. Um, from my understanding, yes, but I think that you should read that Supreme Court um, opinion that was issued. I think it talks about that, the reverse a little bit as well, but I understand that, yes, that's true, but everybody check yourself. Good, good one to call the ethics hotline about maybe. Um, okay, so someone also asked, <clears throat> I'm concerned with timeshare exit companies that are not usually in Florida and do not have any attorney information. How do they get away with advertising on TV all the time and not getting hit with UPL? I've heard, uh, I have heard that they have taken thousands of victims. Um, sometimes people don't get in trouble for UPL because nobody files a complaint. But I don't know the exact circumstances here, but I have seen many things that I feel rise to the level of UPL, but if nobody's filing a complaint, nobody's going to do anything about it. So, um, you know, see something safe from here. All right, and I'm multitasking here. I'm emailing the Florida Bar while I'm doing this. So that's what I'm, I'm emailing about, just so everybody knows. Um, so I see here, property managers are permitted to file uncontested evictions for owners. In our work, we see this even where the owner or property manager are corporations or LLCs. Has the committee dealt with the issue of corporate pro se representation and in particular in this context? And I know you did mention that a little earlier about pro se uh, representation as a corporation. Um, but also maybe if you can speak particular to this top uh, context. No, I think it's a really good question. And my committee hasn't dealt with it specifically, but my understanding would be that's a no-go. Um, this is a corporation. They must have an attorney if it's a contested eviction. End of story. Um, but I think that that would, would come through the affirmative defenses, but then you could essentially um, file a UPL complaint against that property manager and see, see where it gets traction. It's a great question, James. Awesome. And I know, I, I know last time you and I spoke, we talked a little bit about this, you know, going back to one of the first questions we had about the responsibility in regard to supervising paralegals and support staff. And I think that a lot of people are, are always concerned about their roles. And, and you brought up something interesting to me that sometimes your paralegals and your support staff have like an extensive amount of ability and right to, you know, go forward and do representation on certain, like I think you said it was administrative practice, right? And then other times, you know, you need to know when to, to um, I draw the line if that's the better way to say it. Um, is there anything you wanted to say on that? Because I think it's an interesting topic and really any guidance that, um, you know, attorneys and their support staff can have in order to Kind of move forward together in a place that nobody feels uncomfortable that everybody knows their roles how can p how can we all know our roles in that that topic if that makes sense so the administrative practice if it's something that is authorized then they can move forward on their own um but i know that in my office we we sometimes employ paralegals who do social security hearings who do housing you know things with the housing authority. Um, I still feel like it's really important to supervise those cases because as the manager of the office, I think it's on me to make sure that those cases are, are done correctly. But essentially, if they are working under an administrative law category that is an authorized area, um, they can do it. And it won't be my license at the end of the day. Does that make sense? But I think, you know, responsible management of an office says you make sure it's correct. I don't think I answered your question, but that's how I do it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, uh, Michael. I know we are, um, something else just came in real quick and it's more of a comment back to that last question that we had about the uh, corporate pro se representation. Uh, Jennifer had a county court judge cite a small claim rule to support the judge's position that a corporate representative non-lawyer could represent a corporation in an eviction case. Um, so, you know, those property managers and 
So thank you, Jennifer, for sharing that. Jennifer, too, did they, in that case, did they also file like the, you know, where they file the consent of the owner to file on their behalf? Did they file that there? I'm just curious. Yeah, Jennifer, if you, if you know the answer to that. I do know Jennifer said in the chat, I wasn't convinced that it was the correct application, <laughs> but it may be a trend we see. So Jennifer, I don't know if you know the answer to, to Michael's question on that. And while uh, we give Jennifer a few minutes to, to uh, answer up in, uh, in the chat. Ooh, and now Jennifer, you're being asked for a case citation. <laughs> so I don't know if you have that as well. I'll buy some airtime while, while you put that into the chat and we appreciate you. Um, you know, I wanted to say, <clears throat> you know, thank you so much, Michael. This is a, a tough conversation. Lawyers don't want to talk about it. We, we don't want to talk about it. We just want to pretend like it doesn't happen. And we always want to say, you know, it's not us, it's someone else. So it's always really good uh, to just have this information, like we said earlier, to destigmatize from the fear and, and have a better understanding of really what these processes are and, and how it works. Uh, when we know uh, how a process goes, we're less scared, right? So I know that was your goal going into this training, and I think you accomplished that very well, and I appreciate you sharing your time with us and speaking with us um, and uh, giving us this information. So I know there's some discourse going on in the chat about this, this conversation. I'm gonna let I'm gonna let that go. Uh, Jennifer also put another comment in the chat for folks who are interested in getting in that information. Um, and just quickly with the CLE code, I'm very sorry that it's not posting properly. I did just reach out to our contact at the Florida Bar who approved this for CLE credit. Um, it is approved for one general CLE credit. I'm actually already in talks with them about trying to get some professionalism credit for this too, because I think that that is worthy. So um, everyone just keep an eye on your inbox. You'll get an email from me um, in order to clarify what the credit is and what the, the code is. And as always, you can reach out to me. My email address is at the top. Uh, don't be shy. And with that being said, I'm sure Michael has lots of fires to put out herself. So uh, thank you very much. Is there anything else you wanted to say before we sign off? Thank you all and get on those committees, get on those committees. And when you see that there's like reasonable conversation that takes place, you're just going to feel better. You're going to sleep better at night. Get on those committees and join the public interest law section of the Florida Bar. Yes. <laughs> all right. Well, you're getting lots of thank yous in, in the chat. I can't thank you enough for participating as a presenter in our training initiative. Um, and I look forward to seeing everybody at the next training. Have a good one. Bye.